Hello, my friends. This is Sleepy Reader with a salute to Vinku12000 in that I'm going to answer the questions from his contest, which has um, already passed. I was just too busy during the month of December, but I kept thinking I would like to answer his questions. He asked a lot of intriguing questions. And um, while I'm at it, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of a haul of past month and a half I've bought quite a few back issues which I haven't had a chance to show so these will be some of them and uh, but I'll start with his first question uh, Mr. Vin Crew asks us to make predictions about the comic world things that might happen in the next two or three years so I'm just you know I'm not gonna predict anything radical I'm seeing the trends that are already happening with image comics and with perhaps more women and younger people trying out comics that perhaps uh, an, an influx that we haven't seen in a while. And I predict that the importance of trades is going to be on the rise. I think for a while trades were less important, um, although they've that's been a general trend over a long period of time and perhaps has hurt comics in a certain way. But anyway, I think we're going to see more writing for the trades, more power to the trades. I think, for instance, Image is making a lot of its money off of trades. I think um, we'll see other companies battling for that trade market where I think a lot of beginning readers um, or non-traditional comics readers tend to go towards the trades. And so I think there'll be even more money for comics to be made there. I think that... Um, I think with the the increase in the TV and movies of comics, we've seen an increase in speculation in comic book collect for comic book collectors. I think we will see that continue. I don't think we'll see a collapse of the market in the next two or three years, although I do see a collapse in the market within five to ten years. I don't think it'll be a sudden collapse the way we had in the 90s. I think it's been a slower buildup, and it will be a slower deflation of the bubble. Um, I think the idea of um, key issues will, to a certain degree over the next five to ten years, fizzle a bit. Um, but I do think that in general the inflation of prices of most valued books will continue. Um, that that is not going to go away, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, that's how I sort of see those two markets, the collector's market and the new comics market. So uh, on, the, on that note of collector's markets, I, when I buy back issues, I do them based on my own personal nostalgia, things I wish I had as a kid or things that now seem cool to me that I didn't notice as a kid. Um, and with Silver and Bronze Age comics, uh, the covers matter a lot to me. So uh, one thing I've been doing is looking for Neil Adams covers that I can easily afford. And uh, this past month I bought quite a few Batman and Superman Neil Adams covers. I'm just going to show you the Batman ones now because I plan to do a Superman one at some later date. I don't think any of these have interior art by Neil Adams. Um, and perhaps that's part of why I could afford them. I'm not sure if that affects the price. Perhaps someone like Vin Crew could tell me. So I've got this Batman one, which I've always loved this cover. It feels like Neil Adams was being a bit experimental with the background. Um, but I love the gothicness of, or when Neil Adams did these gothic Batman covers, I really liked them a lot. Um, and to me, they really characterize that kind of era of the, the better side of the 70s, early 70s, late 60s Batman. Um, so yeah, that these were both detective comics. And then in the Batman Neil Adams phase, I got one more, uh, just a straight Batman. Um, I actually like this cover best, I should have said. Uh, I always, there's something kind of super creepy about a picture of someone being hung, especially if they're still alive. Um, but all of these covers have kind of a creepy, anxiety-provoking quality to them. And that seems part of what I notice about the Neil Adams covers from the 
the late 60s, early 70s, is a certain anxiety-provoking quality, which maybe went away with his covers just a little later. Um, but per- that's just my theory about Neil Adams at the moment. So um, now I'm going to go on to uh, Vin Cruz's next question. He actually asked like about nine questions or, or five questions, and the fifth one had many parts. But so the second question was, is there a bubble in the industry now? Um, and I guess I kind of answered that in the first one. There's kind of a bubble in collecting, which I think will deflate. I mean, we've all seen it over and over again. And most issues are not that valuable. And I, I enjoy buying the ones that aren't that valuable because they're just as valuable to me as the key issues or whatever. But I think that that's eventually got to fizzle, but I think it's going to take a while to fizzle, as I said. And there may be, you know, image maybe having its own bubble where it overextends itself and has raised the hope of too many creators that they can really have an independent career. And so there may be some kind of bursting of the economics of being an independent creator as a bubble. You know, too many people trying to make a living from from making their own comics. And so that might deflate at some point. Although I suspect there's always some new talent coming along willing to give it a try. So yeah, on the subject of Neil Adams, I mostly bought this because of Neil Adams. But I remember in the few slightly older comic books I bought as a kid, you know, meaning, slightly older meaning, uh, you know, the early 70s, late 60s comics, because I bought my first comic in 71 or 72, and probably by 74 was buying a pretty good amount of comics. So comics from before then always seem special to me. But this is a, a great Neil Adams cover, and it it doesn't have as much of that anxiety as it on the DC covers. There seems to be more just this cool illustration quality to me. Um, anyway, I love this cover, but I was... Uh, I would always see ads for Red Wolf or mentions of Red Wolf here or there in old comics I would find as a kid, but I never saw a comic book by him. So when I saw this, not too expensive, with a Red Wolf, Red Wolf with a cover by Neil Adams, it was kind of a no-brainer. I grabbed it. Um, I have no idea if it's valuable. It might even be a reprint on the inside. I, I, because of my busy December, I haven't really had a chance to look at the inside. Um... There was one other thing I wanted to say about Red Wolf here. Oh, well, now I've forgotten it. Oh, one thing I should note is, for whatever reason, the stores in my area several times a year will have these 50% off back issue... Um, back issues of their back... Sales of their back issues, like for Black Friday or the day after Christmas or the week after Christmas or the New Year's Day or what have you. Um... So I've kind of gotten to the point where I don't buy back issues unless it's a 50% off sale. And at some of the stores, the prices really aren't fair until they're close to 50% off anyway. But I don't remember what I, what I paid for these, to tell you the truth. So in the, speaking of Red Wolf, I also grabbed, I need to find a bag for it, um, this Avengers with Red Wolf on the cover. Uh, and I always wanted this too. I remember seeing this cover reproduced in some other comic book. It looks like it was drawn by John Busma with, Busema with inks by Tom Palmer, I want to say. I don't know if Busema drew the interior since I have it open. Yeah, it is John Busema. So I'm pretty excited to have this. Uh, so yeah, uh, Vin Cruz's next question was, make a suggestion to Marvel, DC, and Image on how to improve their position with us as readers. Well, Marvel and DC, but Marvel most of all to me needs to slow down on the, everyone says this, on the big crossover events. They're just sort of tiresome and they seem to, to me, they seem to reduce the desirability of um, their mainstream comics. Uh, Obviously, they still make better sales with these events than without, so they keep doing it. So in a way, it's really our fault for buying into them. I am trying to avoid events from both Marvel and DC as much as possible. Sometimes there's a book you just want to keep getting anyway. Um, And to Marvel, I would say uh, improve your pricing. (laughs) 
if you're going to charge four bucks for a book, give us higher quality covers. Do give us a few extra pages. Um, you're just slowly wearing down the loyal Marvel readers, I think, by giving the worst, the worst value for money in the comics book industry. And we know that you are making lots of money. Um, so yeah, uh, to DC, I would say also chill out with the events, give your creators more room to breathe, and don't be so obsessed with continuity. It seems like DC is even more obsessed with continuity than Marvel, and it just doesn't work over you know 52 books being published every month. You need to be a little mellower, and frankly, DC Comics are more rooted in an all-ages... I think in the long run you'd sell more if people could jump on the comics easy, casual readers could pick them up and read an issue of Superman and just enjoy that issue. Um, If they find themselves in the middle of incredibly complex continuity, they're just not going to continue. Image... Okay, with Image, I feel like you're doing all the right things, uh, but watch out. I think your love of science fiction and horror has you um, over-saturating the market with that. And I know that you're telling lots of creators just do what you want, but uh, maybe uh, have a little more of an editorial hand and say, okay, we've got 20 science fiction books coming out this year, let's hold off on the science fiction books for a while. As much as I love science fiction, I'm using that as a, as a suggestion. Vin Cruz's fourth question is, say you had a terminal illness and you lived in a world without photography or video or anything like that. Which comic book artist living or dead, would you like to draw your portrait to leave behind for your family? And it'll be the only portrait of you they'll ever have. And that's real tough. There's so many people to choose, but I I actually have thought about this one for a while after hearing other people make, give answers on it. And I would like Richard Corbin to do my um, portrait because he has a sort of semi-realistic style, but he also captures all kinds of psychological weirdness and stuff and I think a Richard Corbin portrait of me would be very distinctive and it would stand out in my um, family's memory and even if it didn't look perfectly like me it would still remind them of me more than perhaps a more perfect portrait would so uh, so yeah I'd go with that I mean other runners up might be like Bernie Wrightston would do an amazing job or um uh, on the other side, sort of uh, Frank Avilia, Francisco Frank Avilla. That would be very interesting to have him do a portrait. But if I had to choose one, I think I'd make it Richard Corbin. So I should, this great segue now would be to show you some Richard Corbin books, but I didn't <laughs> pick up any of those in my package hunting. I got a whole bunch more of Avengers, um, which I haven't gotten around to read. This one's in really bad condition, but I love this cover. And, you know, so I guess I picked it up for three bucks. That still has the sticker on it. Uh, There's a really nice one. I don't know why, but I love the Avengers period with Goliath. And in in general, I love this sort of uh, Roy Thomas, John Buscema period of the Avengers. It's my favorite. I don't know if I if I reread it all, maybe it wouldn't be as good as I remember it or think of it being. I think I read a lot of it as a kid in reprints, like in something called Marvel Spotlight or something like that. Um, And it seemed marvelous to me then. (laughs) And I just love these covers. Oh, here's a real favorite cover of mine uh, with the Valkyrie and the other women having defeated the uh, male Avengers. It's pretty hilarious. Oh, and here's a favorite villain of mine, Archon. Um... Another, these are just such amazingly cool covers. Uh, and this is coming from the, the era, again, these were comics you know, that I sort of knew existed when I was a kid, but had no way of finding. Uh, so I just love picking them up now. Um, 
I don't focus on high grades. I do try to have a, a nice looking cover. This one is not as nice. It's kind of curled on the spine there. But anyway, so those are things I'm very happy to have picked up in the past month or so. Um, so his fifth question, fifth and last question, is four questions in one. Choose one of these two books in the same excellent condition. Here, I'll leave up some Avengers while I'm chatting. Um, so I have to choose book A or book B. They're both in excellent condition. In each case, they're classics of the field. So one is showcase number four, the first appearance of the Silver Age Flash, or Fantastic Four number one. And I'd, I'd love to have both, obviously, but I've had to choose one. I think Fantastic Four, number one, because for me, the the real importance of the Silver Age was the Marvel Age of comics, and I feel like all superhero comics that we read today are based on what Stan Lee and his small stable of artists did during you know those first ten years of the Marvel Age. So uh, the Fantastic Four is just a milestone in my mind that, you know, would be just utterly amazing to own. So, and then he asks, Batman number one or Amazing Spider-Man number one? Now there, you know, Batman... <laughs> I'd have to pick Batman. I mean, obviously Amazing Spider-Man is part of that modern uh, heritage too, but... Batman is sort of the bedrock of of the field. And so to own Batman number one, it would be even better to own Detective 27. But anyway, Batman number one there. And um, let's see. Then he asks, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one or Walking Dead number one? And that's a real hard one for me because I think the Walking Dead is a... Really cool phenomenon. This is the next comic I plan to show. Speaking of horror comics. Um, it's a really cool phenomenon, and there were very few copies of the first issue published. But I have... I think I have an extra affection for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, there's a very small run of that, too, obviously. Um... Each one has kind of revolutionized small press publishing in its own day, so they're really equal. But I guess I would choose the Turtles. I'm not sure why. Maybe because The Walking Dead just seems so familiar at the moment, it doesn't seem as exciting as this black-and-white relic from uh, the old days that the uh, Turtles would be. And then his last comparison of two issues is New Mutants 98, which I guess is the first Deadpool. I'm not up on my Deadpool lore. Versus Batman Harlequin number one. And I definitely like Harlequin, Harley Quinn way better than Deadpool. Although, obviously, Deadpool has spawned a lot of fun comics. I would... Uh, Harlequin is just more of a class act for me or something. I don't know. I like her better, so I'd pick that one. So those are all Vin Crew's questions. And uh, I have a few more things to show you, and then I'll say goodnight. So I picked up Marvel Spotlight, Son of Satan, number 12. This is the origin of Damon, Damien Hellstrom. So as most of you know, my name is Damien, and I, I almost look like this with my shirt off. So I, uh, I've i always meant to get more Son of Satan. I think I had a Son of Satan appearance or two as a kid, and it seemed... Things involving hell seemed extra exciting to me as a young Catholic boy, too. So I don't know what took me so long to pick this up. It, it also was not very expensive. And uh, it's a cool cover. I'm not sure who drew that. It looks like it was inked by uh, Jim Mooney, but uh, that's just my off-the-cuff. Could have been inked by Tom Sutton, I suppose. It might almost be Romita inked by Tom Sutton, with Sutton adding kind of a sloppierness to it. I don't know. That's really hard to say. 
I remember seeing a lot of ads for Son of Satan in other comics that I had. And then here are some comics that I had, all of these, I believe, you know, when I was a kid, when I was 11 or 12, or 13 or whenever, I guess probably 11 or 12. I think uh, I found the way to get comic books was to ask for subscriptions to them for my birthday and Christmas. So I got a subscription to the Defenders. So I remember getting these in the mail all folded up. Um, and they're long gone, and I got a good price on them. And I have a real strong nostalgic affection for the Defenders because they were sort of the odd outsider group who somehow managed to work with the Hulk. And I loved Valkyrie especially for some reason. Not in a romantic love, I just thought she was a cool character. And I always thought this was an amazing, uh, the Squadron Sinister, which I guess is, is that related to the Squadron Supreme? I'm pretty sure it is. I always forget what that relationship is, if they're the same team but from two different universes, or are they actually heroes who are mistaken for villains? I need to reread this. Um, I believe all of these on the interiors have um, Sal Buscema. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really sweet um, Gil Kane cover. There's always something extra twisty about Gil Kane's figures that I really like, um, so I know, always know right away that they're Gil Kane, even if there isn't an, up the no, an obvious up-the-nose shot. A little bit of up-the-nose there. And uh, I remember this issue. I remember really liking this issue. I don't remember why. I guess I think I thought Nebulon looked really cool. Nebulon, the man who bought Earth. This cover, I think, <laughs> I always found disturbing. <laughs> this skinny, bald guy in the background holding them on scales. It just seemed wrong to me. But anyway, glad to have gotten that. I think I've... So I'm still is missing issue 15, unless I've got that somewhere else lying around. And finally, I have... This one, which is a really great cover. I don't know who that cover's by. Is that John Romita? Um, but I love this cover. I love the old look for Luke Cage. I suppose, you know, it may have questionable elements. I don't know if there's stereotypes involved or whatever, or why they had to give him whatever costume he has now, but I love that costume back then. I also always liked the inclusion of Nighthawk in The Defenders. And at the time, I totally did not get that he was a ripoff of Batman. Um, so, I, And I think he comes out of the Squadron Supreme. So that there was also that nice feeling of villains turning into heroes like Valkyrie, etc. in The Defenders that I always liked. So thanks for hanging out with me, and I will be back soon with more videos, maybe even more hauls. Talk to you all later.